At long last, after 8 billion years of computation, the greatest computer ever developed, Deep Stupor, will reveal its answer to the great question of existence, the cosmos, and what in the symbol is going on? And the answer is, what? No. Even in ASCII, an asterisk is just a number. This makes no sense. Where are the units? The Greatest Mysteries of the Universe With Cosmologist Lawrence Krauss, author of The Edge of Knowledge and The Physics of Star Trek Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion, I'm James Maynard This week we explore the greatest mysteries of the universe We're Talking about the Big Bang, black holes, dark matter, dark energy and the nature of time Later in the show, we're going to be talking with famed cosmologist and author Lawrence Krauss. Now, it all started with a big bang. Bang. Cosmologists debate what, if anything, might have existed before this explosive event. The laws of physics needed to model these conditions fall apart as infinities come into play while trying to describe the initial moment of this eruption 13.8 billion years ago. But we can get close, very close. For the first 10 millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, all known uh, forces of nature re reunited as one, and the very fabric of space-time itself was, a sub was subject to the chaotic nature of quantum physics. A bizarre, if short-lived, start to our universe known as the Planck Epoch. A hundredth of a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the big kickoff, the universe seems to have experienced a strange period known as inflation. At this time, the universe appears to have expanded at a rate much faster than the speed of light, growing from, the, from smaller than an atom to the size of a golf ball almost instantly. Why that happened remains a mystery. Next up, black holes. The best known category of these are stellar mass black holes formed when a massive star dies and collapses in on itself. Uh, black holes have such an immense gravitational pull that nothing, not even light, can escape their grasp. The only exception to this appears to be Hawking radiation, a process which allows some thermal energy to escape the grips of these intergalactic vacuum cleaners. Matter falling into these regions of space becomes accelerated, pulled, stretched, and blasted with unimaginable amounts of radiation. However, some information about the interloping body should still remain within the black hole. What happens to that information and what's going on at the center of a black hole remains the debates of vigor subject to vigorous debates among some of the greatest minds in the world. Well, we happen to have one of those minds in the studio today. Well, actually, he himself stayed at home as a stationary body in the past while his image was here in the studio at nearly a simultaneous point in time, creating a 2D representation of his 3D state for you to listen to in my future, which is now your present and... Ah. Here's Lawrence Krauss talking about what we discover when we dare to journey to the edge of knowledge. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined once again by Dr. Lawrence Krauss. He is a theoretical physicist and cosmologist. He is the author of one of my 
favorite all-time science books, The Physics of Star Trek. And he's here to talk to us about The Edge of Knowledge and his new show, The Origins Podcast. Welcome to the show, Arms. It's great to be back with you again, at least virtually. It's nice to be here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have... I'm on Earth. It looks like you're in the, out in the cosmos. It looks like you have cosmic strings behind you. Right yes, now. yes, yes. Anyway, that's exactly okay, what it sorry, is. No. <laughs> um, so, a few weeks ago on the show, um, we were talking with uh, cosmologist Andrew Ponson. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd like you to start off, if you could, by answering the same question that he started off with, sure. which is... What is cosmology and how do you define it? You know, cosmology is a study of the, of the largest scales of the universe, so the, basically the dynamics of, a, of the universe as a whole and not just the parts within it. Parts within it tend to be the province of astrophysics and then other areas of physics, but trying to understand the dynamics of the universe, its large scale structure, its origin, its evolution, and its future. And um, that's basically it. And the great thing about the universe is that it was, uh, from a particle physicist perspective, is that it was a great particle exp physics experiment. It was done once, as far as we can tell. Now it's just data analysis. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And your new book is, called, is titled At the Edge of Knowledge. And, um, or excuse me, At the Edge of Knowledge. So what are the greatest questions at the edge of knowledge? Well, I, I mean, what I wanted to do was follow up in some sense on in my last two books, The Universe and Nothing, which talked about the potential origin of our universe as we understand it and the revolutions that have taken place in cosmology over the last 50 years. And then and then the next one was The Greatest Story We Told So Far, which talked about the origins the development of what's called the standard model of particle physics, so that, that describes all the forces that we know and is the best theoretical picture we have of the universe. And all of those take us to the point of open questions, and I thought it would be a wonderful way to try and move on to talk about, indeed, the open questions, because, as I say at the beginning of the book, saying I don't know is really the, the, an invitation to discover. Mm. And, and I, after some time, eventually the book settled down to be five main large chapters, time, space, and life, and consciousness. Because the fundamental questions that we really ask about the universe come down to those areas. And, and the wonderful thing is that the questions that we all have about ourselves and the universe, you know, how did the universe begin? Are we alone in the universe? When I see green, is it the same color you see, etc.? They really are the same questions that are at the forefront of modern science. So it was a wonderful way, hook for me to allow me to talk about those open issues, which of course require me to bring people up to speed in all those areas and and to and to have fun talking about uh what we what we know and we don't know it's it's a celebrate it's not a it's a celebration of discovery not of ignorance mm. and and the other thing that's important about it is that that while we i focus on the things we don't know and i can and each chapter begins with questions and i can give some of those questions that should not be confused as saying we know nothing. It's all, too often when, when we say we don't know everything, people interpret that to mean we know nothing, and that's not true. We know an incredible amount about the universe. And, um, you know, when it comes to time, big questions, uh, you know, what is time? Is, is, is time subjective, objective? It, can you go backwards in time? How, what, how did the universe begin? How will it end? And space, is our universe unique? Uh, uh, can there be many laws of physics and, 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 and uh, are they different in each universe? When it comes to matter, I, I talk about quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics is weird and, and we still, though most of us think it's a fundamental theory of the universe, not everyone does and, and it's, it's inconsistent with general relativity. And so which is the more fundamental theory is something we still have yet to discover. And then I proceed to the questions of life and consciousness, which may sound like they're beyond the province of a physicist, but in fact, physicists have a long history of being involved in thinking about the origins and evolution of life um, from Erwin Schrodinger's book, What is Life?, that inspired uh, James Watson to become a geneticist, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, and Max Delbruck's book on, on, on life, which actually inspired, inspired Schrodinger, and Max Delbruck was a physicist. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in biology, but but for work he did while still a physicist. And so these kind of questions are, and they also are, get to be the, the the 
the more difficult questions, the last chapter on consciousness, I happen to think trying to understand consciousness is a lot harder than trying to understand the universe. So, so anyway, I'll talk about that. So those are some of the open questions. And it's, and indeed consciousness, I argue, is even difficult to define. It's not clear we have a good definition of it, much less a understanding of it. And it may ultimately require us to develop an Another consciousness, uh, artif- what artificial intelligence consciousness, maybe that will help us understand what consciousness is. So I talk about that. Anyway, so it touches on basically everything, uh, uh, life, the universe, and everything. And I thought it might, uh, it's not clear to me my next books will be science books. So I thought this was a nice sort of, um, uh, I don't know, the climax is a better, is a way of putting it, but a nice uh, topping for, for the books that I've written. Mm, sounds so fascinating. And um, this is probably no better place to start any origin story than with the origin of the universe. Uh What do we know about the Big Bang? Was there anything before? What triggered it and how did it come about? Well, that's a lot of good questions. The answer answer to all of them is we don't know, which is a great thing. As I say, we shouldn't be ashamed of it because it is an invitation to discover. We have ideas and my my book, Universe of Nothing, you know, focused on on what I think is most plausible possibility uh, for our universe itself, that it, it did began spontaneously from nothing by the laws of physics and quantum mechanics and general relativity. Uh, that spaces and times can pop into existence when there's no space and time. And a universe with 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars, can pop into existence initially as a universe with zero total energy. And it may sound weird when you look at around us and, and, and see all the stuff out in the universe to think that maybe there's zero total energy there. But, but our best estimate for the total energy of the universe is, is zero because gravity has negative energy configurations as well as positive energy ones. So that's sort of that, that was the context of a universe of nothing. But a broader question is, well, that's fine if our universe sprang up from nothing spontaneously. But does that beg the question of whether there are other possible universes? And indeed, the, the, the best theory we have about our understanding of the large scale structure of the universe is called inflation, which says that the very early, earliest moments of our Big Bang, our universe expanded by an unimaginably large amount. And that happens naturally in almost any particle physics picture of the early universe. And in that picture in general, as Andre Linde really was the first to emphasize, Inflation never ends. The expansion of space continues at a, va- a rapid space forever. Local pockets of the, uh, of, and we call, some people call them pocket universes, can break free of that background expansion and have their own little big bangs. And our universe could be one. But other regions may just be having a big bang now or, or maybe just collapsing. And, and, the, and the other interesting thing is that as you leave infra- inflation, the manifestations of the laws of, of physics can be different. So there could be different laws of physics in each universe. This picture of a multiverse has changed our whole understanding of what we think the large scale structure of the universe might be like, or the multiverse might be like. And it's 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 speculative. I, I've done work to try and show that we might actually be able to get di- empirical evidence, albeit indirect evidence, of the existence of other universes. And and I think that would turn it from metaphysics to physics. And anytime you can turn something from metaphysics into physics, that's a good thing. Uh, but in, in any case, so there, there are you know, the, these universes could go on. That system could go on expanding forever, and potentially be an infinite number of such universes. Can we extrapolate that in the past and say that the expansion has been going on infinitely long in the past? And the answer is we can't, because in order to understand what happened, literally, if there was a before our universe, we have to have a theory of quantum mechanics and gravity, and we don't have a theory of quantum mechanics and gravity. And so to understand that instant of creation, if you want to call it that, you really have to have a theory of quantum gravity. We don't have it. In the, in the standard theory of general relativity, if you apply it back, our expanding universe back, it tells us that our universe had a finite beginning 13.8 billion years ago. But um, but it doesn't tell us about anything else, and uh, it doesn't tell us about that nature, that instant of beginning. The po- there are two possibilities, one of which is is possible, and I know Stephen Hawking used to describe it, and I think it's very appropriate that, that there was no time before the beginning of our universe. It's not even a good question. Time came into existence when our universe came into existence, as space did. 
since space and time are tied together. But it could be that there's a cosmic time in our universe sprang into existence at an instant in that in that sort of time slice of a multi expanding multiverse. And there could have been in, in that sense in the multiverse, there could be times before at the beginning of our universe. We just don't know the answer. Hmm. That is so fascinating. And speaking of time, there's been a lot of talk lately and especially like even in the popular press about the nature of time. And if it's yeah, I mean, even real, what, what yeah. is time, Lawrence? Well, I mean, it's time is the thing that determines when you end your interviews. But, um, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, some people say time is an illusion, some, even some physicists, and it may be. But I find that particularly useless uh, because it may be an illusion, uh, but it's if you miss the 515 train home for work from work, it's not an illusion. It's a real thing. And right. and um, and so the question is, even if it is an illusion, how does that come about time? As we know, it's just a, it's something that basically labels when events happen in space. Space and time are tied together in, in, in especially in general relativity. So every every event happens at a space time point. And and that and 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 space and time are really parameters that describe where and when those events happen. And in general relativity, different observers can have different definitions of time and space. In fact, and and different coordinate systems to describe them. But the laws of physics is independent of those different descriptions. Uh, and and so the question it's like it's like the nature of there are many illusions. That you know the the, the classical universe that the, the desk this chair I'm sitting on is an illusion. It's a classical object, but really it's the quantum mechanics is governing its basis. And 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 the question is how does that illusion of a classical universe arise? Some people argue that consciousness is an illusion. Well, that's again I maybe, but how does that illusion arise? And so um, we don't know um, whether time is an illusion, but we do know a lot about the fact that that it is an individual characteristic that time is different for different observers that if that if you're traveling fast with respect to me your clocks tick at a slow rate if you're high up in the in, in, above the earth your clocks tick at a slower rate because of gravity and all of that sounds esoteric and almost science fiction like but it's neither as i describe in the book uh we use that fact those esoteric facts every day if you if you use your phone and the GPS on your phone to get anywhere today, you're relying on general relativity because the clocks on the satellites high up are travel are ticking at a different rate than the clock uh, on the ground. And in order to find out where you are, you would need two or three satellites. You measure the time it takes for the light signal to go back and forth from the satellite, and then you triangulate that and find out where you are. But if the clocks are out of sync, then your position will be out of sync. And it turns out because of general relativity, Primarily, those clocks are ticking at a different rate, and we have to take that into effect explicitly. Mm. The, the manufacturers and the, and the systems that produce GPS have to take that general relativistic effect into account. Otherwise, within an hour, you'd be a kilometer away from where you thought you were. So even those esoteric things have an application in our everyday life. Mm. Of course, uh, the biggest mystery of time is time travel. Mm. You know, can you go back in time, which, you know, if you like the physics of Star Trek, I talk about there because because, it, you know, it's, it's sort of the thing that fascinates us most and fascinates science fiction writers the most because of all the wonderful stories you can do about what changing the future by going into the past from Star Trek to back to the future. Um, and uh, and the answer to is time travel possible is that once again, we don't know. It looks like it would be very difficult and it certainly would produce paradoxes like the grandmother paradox, what happens if you go back in time and kill your mother before you, uh, before you, your grandmother before you were born, let's, get, let's say kill your grandmother, well, then your, your mother would never be born, and then you'd never be born, but if you weren't born, how do you go back in time and kill your, kill your grandmother in the first place? So those kind of paradoxes would have to be resolvable in a universe that allowed time travel, but we just don't know. You know Stephen Hawking used to say that time travel was impossible. Even even once off, it created a, a cocktail party where he invited people from the future to attend, and no one came. And, <laughs> in, in any case, uh, and we have two great mysteries 
there are many great mysteries, but two of the greatest mysteries about the universe are what is most of the universe. Uh, dark matter and dark energy both appear to be out there in trem tremendous quantities, but what are yeah. they? What, what are your well, that's, those have been the subject of my research for the last 50 years almost. Um, I, I proposed a number of candidates for dark matter, and I'm happy to say I helped propose mo many of the experiments that are now ongoing to look for dark matter. We think dark matter is simpler. Well, we know dark matter is simpler. Um, dark matter is a, we, it, most likely a new type of elementary particle and that's unlike the particles we see on Earth. And, we, and it may sound like, well, you're just inventing a tooth fairy to explain it. But the point is that every theory we have beyond the standard model of particle physics, every time we try and extend that model, we come up with the prediction of new particles. And those new particles have, in many cases, properties that would be perfect to be dark matter and actually could be produced in the early universe in an abundance which would make them dark matter today. Um, one has to remember that, that it's pretty easy for things to be invisible in a sense, that for every proton in the universe today, there are over a billion photons from the cosmic microwave background behind you and and uh, and 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 going through my body this room right now. And so by number, matter is very rare. One one proton for every billion or so photons. Well, even though photons are the most observable thing in the universe, we didn't discover the cosmic microwave background until 1965. Mm. And um and so you can imagine other processes producing other particles that are less strongly interacting than photons that could still easily be invisible. And in fact, as I say, one actually finds such processes in the early universe. So we're building experiments to look for those things. And I think it's quite among the among the, the known unknowns, the problems I talk about in my new book, I think dark matter is one area where we may, if we're lucky, have the answer in the next decade or two. Dark energy is a much more difficult problem because it's totally inexplicable. Why should empty space have energy? Why should the dominant energy in the universe reside in empty space? So if you take away all the particles and radiation, space still weighs something, and we don't understand why. And and it's crazy. I mean, when we first proposed that that, that was the case in our universe in 1995 or so, it seemed it seemed crazy, but it, it was a way to explain the data. And it wasn't until 1998 when the observers got clear evidence that the expansion of the universe is accelerating, which is a consequence of being dominated by the energy of empty space, that people began to believe it. I'm not sure, even when I proposed it in 95, that I believed it. I just probably thought some of the experiments were wrong. Uh, but it's the biggest mystery. We don't have any, any idea why that that energy is there, what it's made, what what it's due to, why it has the value. As it's this mystery in fundamental physics and. Um, and that's exciting because it means that, you know, there's a lot to discover. But because I think it probably relates to our understanding of, once again, gravity and quantum mechanics, it's going to be a much more difficult nut to crack than perhaps uh, discovering the nature of dark, dark matter. So interesting. Uh, and finally, um, what's your opinion on or your thoughts on how common life may be throughout the cosmos? and? How long until we find it in one form or another? Yeah, that's one of the known the, the, the central topics in my chapter on life. And the answer, of course, is I don't know, once again. But but we do know that almost all stars have, have planetary systems around them, meaning there are perhaps 100 billion solar systems in our galaxy. We also know that life evolved on Earth about as soon as the laws of physics allowed. Mm -hmm after the late bombardment of comets and asteroids and Jupiter had ate them all up or kicked them in the outer solar system. Within a few hundred million years, the oldest falls on Earth have been discovered. And so if we're typical in that sense, it would suggest that life formed relatively quickly once the laws of physics allowed it. And what was required was, was organic materials, water and sunlight. All of those exist in profusion in the cosmos. And so in, if you think that way, it, it's, it seems quite likely that there's other life elsewhere in the universe. Of course, there are very specific circumstances that allow life to evolve on our on our planet, and that may those may be rare. I I'm betting that we may find even existence of other, of other genesis of life in our solar system, in the oceans of Europa or Enceladus, most likely. 
Um, maybe, you know, I think it's an even bet. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't there, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was. But that's not, of course, intelligent life. The kind of life that most people care about is the kind that communicates. Mm -hmm. That life hasn't been visiting us in little little spacecraft, abducting people and, and subjecting them to weird kinky experiments. That they have <laughs> that hasn't been happening. But 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 we may one day learn about it. I, it's a it's a long shot, you see, because the universe is very big, and even with the SETI, even with listening, you don't know what to listen to or what to listen for. And and intelligent civilizations, if they exist, could be few and far between. They could only exist for a finite time. It, judging by the way we're handling things on Earth, it's not clear how long intelligent technological civilizations survive. So it's an open question, but but I think even if it's rare, it's out there. I just think it's probably, it's not so likely we'll know about it. And uh, therefore that makes, all of this should make us in some sense feel special. You know, even if, if we're unique in the universe, then it's kind of, as Carl Sagan said, a big waste of space. But it means that we probably should even do more to, to try and preserve the, the fortunate circumstance that evolution allowed life to evolve and intelligence to evolve and us to ask these questions. And, and even if we're not, we should just say how lucky we are to be around at this moment in the sun in two or three billion years that it's our, the earth will become uninhabitable regardless of what we do to it. And um, unless it out more towards where to Mars is, which we could do, I suppose, in a billion years. Um, but uh, uh, you, we should just we should just take advantage of this incredible accident and the ability to use our brains and to look out and ask questions and continue to ask questions and continue to build experiments and tools that allow us to answer those questions and then have yet more profound questions. It makes the it makes life worth living. That is beautiful. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Lawrence. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Well, thanks again. It's nice to, nice to be back, and you take care. You too. And that was Lawrence Krauss, theoretical physicist and cosmologist and host of the Origins podcast. Make sure to check it out. Check out his new book, The Edge of Knowledge. Now, if one were to take every star every bit of interstellar dust and every molecule of the intergalactic medium stretching across the universe, we'd still be holding only about 5% of what seems to be out there. The other 95% of everything is made up from a mixture of 27% dark matter and 68% dark energy. But what are they? And how do they affect the universe? These are questions that scientists are currently struggling to understand. Now, galaxies and groups of galaxies only hold together because of what appears to be gargantuan clumps of invisible gravitational centers. Stars and galaxies move exactly like there's far more matter around them than everything we can see. But where the matter should be, there is apparently nothing. The nature of dark matter remains a mystery, although ideas as to its structure are bound, including unseen particles available in both hot and cold varieties, or other exotic explanations. Now, one would think that in the eons since the Big Bang, the expansion rate of the universe would slow down over time. It's logical, it makes sense, and it's not what seems to be happening. Roughly 8 billion years ago, our universe began expanding at an ever-increasing rate, and the nature of a, this dark energy driving that expansion is another of the great mysteries of the universe. <laughs> now, the nature of time is a wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey realm of temporal wonder. Is time an illusion? Lunchtime doubly so. One of the biggest mysteries surrounding time is whether it flows in one direction or if it might also run backward. Nearly every law of physics is perfectly fine running forward or backward in time. Except one, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, 
This principle of entropy might very, very roughly be thought of as a description of how much order there is in a system. Uh, groups of highly organized bodies are said to have a high entropy, that they can do very little work, similar to the way a ball won't roll away on a level ground. Low entropy states are unorganized and thus capable of making things happen. Think of our once motionless ball being lifted away and set down on the streets of San Francisco. In any closed system like the universe, the second law of thermodynamics states that entropy can only rise or stay the same. The, in the universe appears headed to toward a flat, boring, high entropy state. And this second law of thermodynamics is the only known law of physics that can only move forward in time, suggesting a possible root cause for what appears to be the forward-moving nature of time. Or that might not be the case at all. These mysteries are fun, aren't they? These are just a few of the greatest mysteries in the universe, and while we may not have all the answers yet, one thing is for sure. Exploring these questions are exciting and fascinating journeys into the very nature of, well, everything. We're, uh, we're going to be taking a break for the rest of July for the summer break, but we're going to be back on the 5th of August. Remember to head on over to thecosmiccompanion.com.net and .tv and subscribe, follow, share the show with your families, friends, and random acquaintances. Join us at the start of August when we're going to come back for the second half of Season 7 of The Cosmic Companion. This is going to be our most exciting, most entertaining, and most informative season yet. We look forward to having you join us as we explore every nook and cranny of the English muffin that is space and time. Clear skies. <laughs>